thanks for coming. This is both an exceptional and a terrifying moment. I think it is the fate of every AAG president to give the kind of address that when they were a young pup, they thought was a waste of space and time, so this is my turn. <laughs> Thinking geographically, globalizing capitalism and beyond. This is a talk in four movements. There's a first a, a, an overture, if you will, how geography, or parable, how geography became a discipline. Then we'll get into the first main theme of the talk, which is what does it mean to say we should be thinking geographically? Third, the second extended movement, the subject matter that I'm gonna apply this to, the case study, if you will, although I want to argue this applies to enormous number of potential phenomena. This is my particular bugaboo. And then a brief coda. So, how did geography become a discipline? Well, geography emerged in 19th century Europe as the state university emerged. It emerged in Berliner Universität, as it was then called, sponsored by the King Friedrich the Wilhelm III of Prussia, with Edward, excuse me, Wilhelm von Humboldt, the intellectual progenitor behind the idea of a state university that takes the knowledge universal knowledge of the academy and turns it into disciplines. And geography was one of those disciplines. And it's been a struggle for geography ever since to find its place in the academy because it just, as we all know, never seems to fit. So I want to move away from the notion of big G geography as a discipline towards the idea of thinking small g geographically. To get away from the sense of belonging to a club that nobody invited you to and that you didn't really want to belong to anyway because disciplines are bounded, they exclude, they have essential characteristics or at least we're try always trying to find those and inside and outside they become the objects which compete with one another and get ranked. And to move away from that to the notion of thinking geographically as an inclusive project that anybody can engage in in or outside the academy a particular way of thinking and acting upon the world. So what does it mean to think geographically? I want to emphasize five themes. The first is to pay attention to how all knowledge as it is produced is always produced geographically, something which is often forgotten once knowledge gets established. Second, thinking geographically is about a variegated set of ontologies and epistemologies that we attend to in the discipline and that gives it, us, its, vib gives it its vibrancy. Thirdly, of course, it's about what we apply that um, variegation to, what is the content of thinking geographically. Fourth, it's about an idea that I want to advocate, something I've, I've written about on other occasions, of, of a means of achieving the potential of thinking geographically that I call, uh, or I and others call, engaged pluralism. Trevor Barnes and Paul Plummer have joined me in this project. And fifth, although I won't return to this until the end of the talk, this geography about possible worlds, not just about the world in which we live. So let's begin with the idea of how knowledge is always produced geographically. Knowledge is, as Donna Haraway famously quipped, always situated. That means that what we, how we come to know the world, what we take to be important, the interpretations come out of where we find ourselves. Academically, within particular disciplines or particular moments in time, geographically, uh, in terms of our social location as well. If you will, there are a variety, a plethora of intersecting socio-spatial positionalities out of each of which the world comes to be known. And I'm, I want to be clear that I'm not just restricting this to, to professional knowledge producers such as ours. This applies, of course, in the many spaces of everyday life as well. Distinctive experiences, norms, what counts as knowledge emerge from those different positionalities. And those are merged in conversation with one another as the debates, for example, around feminism versus masculinism have shown. There's a relational process through which these positionalities engage. But, as the debate about feminism and masculinity has also shown, these are often, in fact, generally differentially empowered. So there are many so sources out of which local knowledge, local epistemologies come, but many of them then seem to just disappear. 
Yet they're continually reenacted. We continue to come at the world through our experiences, trying to make sense of it. There's a process of repetition. There's a process of differentiation. And occasionally, dramatic shifts occur. So that's one starting point, that, that, that there's a multiple of ways of knowing the world which come out of the different positions that we occupy. Those um, are put in, place, in, in interaction with one another. The knowledge which seems to emerge out of any one perspective is in fact assembled as a result of the activities of all kinds of humans and non-humans that are involved in, in assembling a center of calculation, if you will, a position from which the world comes to be articulated. And one way of putting how knowledge coagulates is to, and this is Helen Longino's terminology, is to say that there are multiple of local epistemologies, but often they seem to disappear, coalesce um, into ubiquitous monisms, established truths as we think and take them to be about the world. Yet these emerge as a result of unequal power relations, some disciplines, some positionalities are much able to to shape social thinking about the world than others. We are very sensitive about this as we think about ourselves in a relatively marginal discipline. And so there are three kinds of questions that come to matter. First, which of these situated knowledges come to travel the world and in some sense displace others? How do these become ubiquitous, big K knowledge, if you will? And should this have happened? Is this an is this a defensible process, an adequate process, or not? And third, what is the process through which other knowledges emanating from other positionalities are sidelined? Now, I'll apply these ideas to globalizing capitalism later, but the point is that many of the consensuses we come to about truths about the world are no, do not emerge out of a foolproof process of knowledge production, but emerge out of this kind of, 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 of relational competition between different perspectives in which many are left aside for reasons that often seem quite arbitrary. The second aspect of thinking geographically I want to emphasize is the importance of the multiple different ways of knowing which, are, which have been engaged with across the discipline and in different areas of the discipline across time as well. The usual way in which we think about this, and these tables are taken from a book by, 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 by Kitchen and Tate, is this a series of boxed isms each of which is, is, a, is given a set of characteristics, and we can go down a long list like this. That, I believe, is not thinking geographically, is to take ways of knowledge and say, okay, you have to take this approach or that approach. You're either a positivist or you're a post-structuralist or you're a feminist. Better, I think, instead of trying to create categories here, is to think relationally about how these different approaches intersect with one another as a field of forces from which we can learn rather than a set of boxes from which we can choose. So one way in which I like to, to depict this with my students is to talk about what I call an epistemological triangle, a continuous space into which we can sort and place these various things. A space which has certain kinds of extremes, Idealism in Western philosophy, the notion that our understanding of the world is a result of the idealizations we impose on it, the meaning we give to it, counterposed against empiricism, too often referred to as positivism in our discipline, in which we take the knowledge to be simply out there and we just have to sort it through and make sense of it. The world is simply a set of, is a set of facts that are subject to observation. And third, tradition being a tradition which issues both idealism and empiricism and argues that the world is shaped by a set of deep forces whose understanding cannot be arrived at through interpretation or observation but require deep theoretical analysis. Each of those has had its role to play in geography. Spatial science falls close to the bottom left end of the triangle, humanistic geography, emerging alongside spatial science in the bottom, in the top corner, and in the other corner, Marxist geography. But over time, various kinds of combinations have emerged. Behavioral geography is about both empirical measurements of how people move, but also about the intentions and, and perceptions that people have of the world. Uh, critical realism is about um, deep structures, but also about the importance of empirical observation in shaping our understanding of those. Post-structuralism 
It's about processes of inequality, but also processes of, of multiple narratives of interpretation. Approaches move through the world. Uh, so feminist geography we can think of as occupying different positions within this triangle at various points of time, moving from, if you like, an empirical tradition of counting women to a much more radical feminist geography to a more post-prefixed. And the same can be said for GIS, which has also had its various positions within this triangle. And what we like to think of as critical geography is somehow occupying a, 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 a zone within here. The point I'm trying to get at with this visualization is that we can see these different um, philosophical approaches as not alternatives to be chosen between, but as things to be engaged across and learned from. And that's going to be a, a light motif for thinking geographically. The same applies to methods and methodologies. We, of course, have a massive list of these. There's just a few of these up on the slide here. And the same point applies, and this is, again, something I try and teach, um, in, in particularly to, to, to graduate students, is, is that there's no one meta-methodology here which is the right one even for any particular problem. There's a menu of possibilities, and the whole point is to be cr creative in connecting those together rather than choosing between them. Let's turn third to the question of what do we think geographically about. And again, at least within the history of Anglophone geography, and, and, and this has been passed down really from, from, from Teutonic geography, we can identify two often overarching themes. Geography is the discipline of space. This was Immanuel Kant's position, or at least how it's often interpreted as the philosopher who famously taught geography in Königsberg. Counterposed against geography is the discipline of human environment relations, an idea which comes down from people like Alexander von Humboldt and Karl Ritter. Let's take each of those in turn to start talking about geography, space, and spatiality. And think in particular about how space relates to society. We have these traditions which emerge in mid-20th century Anglophone geography, particularly here in the United States, of, of, of spaces about the region. In Harchorn's terms, it's about aerial differentiation. It's about a, a contrast, if you will, which starts to emerge in the 1960s between the idea of place on the one hand and the idea of space. And the so-called quantitative revolution in Anglophone human geography, Anglophone geography in general, this is what I would cut my teeth on at Bristol, was about the notion of morphological laws. This is geography as the science of space, because we can produce scientific laws, and they are spatial laws. And it's the idea that, in some sense, space is out there and shapes what happens in society. That, however, gets counterposed with notions like sense of place, which is all about how places are produced through human interaction. And as we move from the, from the humanistic geography in, into radical geography, the notion of the production of space, which was also articulated through readings of Henri Lefebvre around the idea of space as something which different societies produce in different kinds of ways. Over the years, we've moved beyond those kinds of dualistic approaches to what we can comfortably call, I think, socio-spatial theory, which is the notion that spatialities and societies are mutually constituted. But what do we mean by spatialities? Well, again, we've been kind of on a forced march in a particularly human geography, Anglophone human geography, from one metaphor for space to the next, the distance of the quantitative revolution to place of humanistic geography, to scale and the production of scale, to networks, mobility, flat ontologies, in each case seemingly abandoning the previous approach as we've identified a new spatiality, which is the one that really matters. My point here, and again, hope this is getting familiar by now, is that that kind of, 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 of forgetting and, 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 and competing between, well, is it scale or is it a flat ontology, is ultimately not about thinking geographically. It's about boxes and, 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 and rivalries. 
It's about a whole variety of spatialities, including others which are not part of that, if you like, Anglophone narrative at all. So in, in, in other parts of the world, people in other areas, people have emphasized the idea of gray spaces, of partitions, of the paradoxical spaces of Gillian Rose's work on feminist geography. But beyond that, and this is a, a shared gap still in our discipline, is the idea of spatiotemporality, about how space-time is produced in co-evolution in, in co with socio-ecological processes. So that's that aspect of, of, of geography. Turning to the second aspect, we can, I want to use a term which I've learned from, from, from Frank McGilligan and, and Mona Domosch of geography as the discipline of radical intradisciplinarity, the discipline where all kinds of realms of things happening on Earth are important and need to be brought together. Again, it's not about choices here. That there's a whole series. We can think about a, a whole series of, of societal-related processes and operation here, which are not to be separated from the from 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 the from the biophysical processes, each being inflected in and, and affected by the other. In short, a more than human world, a world in which we are one part of many of these processes, each shaped by somewhat different mechanisms, logics, and and, 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 and necessities which uh, emerge alongside one another, in, in, not just alongside, but interpolated with one another. Um, and at the same time, as they do so, shaping the spatiotemporalities of the world in which we find ourselves. So the point here, again, is that in, with, that, with both of these definitions of, of, of geography, the, 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 there's a multiplicity of perspectives that need to be brought together, and the two, in turn, both make up geography. It's not a question of are we the discipline of space or space-time or are we the discipline of human environment relations. All of the above, and that's when it really gets interesting. One way to try and do this, because this sounds incredibly difficult, we're much better in geography as academics are everywhere in, in creating lines and fighting about what seems outside is very minor differences than, than really doing this kind of engagement is to undertake what, what Richard Bernstein has, t has dubbed engaged pluralism. And what he means by engaged pluralism is bringing different perspectives together to mutually engage with and learn from one another, not to fight as to whose perspective is best, but to engage in, if you like, a round table conversation. In feminist philosophy of science, Hen Helen Longino has articulated this very effectively and emphasizes that this has to be a highly inclusive process in which all of those different situated knowledges that we started with, situated in, in disciplines, places, times, and, and social groups, need to be part of the conversation. And it's only through placing them all in conversation with one another and critical mutual engagement with people in each perspective, willing to learn from others, even as they may not feel they need to agree with others, that we start to get different positioned loci of enunciation emerging to um, get us away from the notion of a simple, modest truth about the world. It's about mutual, critical engagement. It's about disagreeing with one another. It's not about having to come to some consensus as to how everything fits together, a consensus which is a least common denominator. It's about learning through ongoing debate and disagreement, keeping those different local epistemologies in play, if you will. There are problems here because, of course, some, some viewpoints, are, as we've, I've argued before, are more powerful than others and have the tendency to push others out of the picture. So we need a strategy, as Iris Marion Young would put it, of empowering some of, those, some of those voices which are more marginalized. So it's not just a question of putting powerful and less powerful voices around the table and thinking that that will lead to a democratic result. There has to be a, a process of of, of, of upending the, the already existing power inequalities to create space for those differently positioned loci to be heard from one another. And as Chantal Mouffe has put it, it's about an agonistic process. It's not simply a rational debate. The prime task is not to eliminate passions, but to argue passionately with one another in ways which make knowledge production always a political process. In the words of Richard Bernstein, in another context, all knowledge is political, even the things we think of as simply empirical. 
as he says in this quote here, there's been a lack of critical self-consciousness among mainstream social scientists that the admonition to be realistic, to study the way things are, is not so much a scientific imperative as a dubious moral imperative that has pernicious consequences in limiting human imagination and political and social possibilities. And this is the possible worlds theme un underlying here. So with all of that in mind, the challenge is to realize the potential of thinking geographically. And by no means an easy process, and, and particularly for a discipline like geography where we want to take the geographical nature of knowledge production seriously, this means engaging across multiple localities of knowledge production, multiple languages, and, and doing so in a world where knowledge production is already, always already dominated by certain locations like the AAG meetings and, 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 and by English as, as, as the lingua franca, if you will. So these are very deep challenges. Let's now take these ideas and apply them to the, to the case study of globalizing capitalism, by which I refer to the way in which over the last three or four centuries, ca the capitalist economic practices have become more and more pervasive as a global phenomenon. And I'm, I'm, and I'm using capitalism in a very heterodox sense here. So I want to look at five issues. What is our common sense idea about what capitalism is? How did capitalism become European? How do we come to believe in it? What are the geographical conditions of impossibility? By, I mean, what is it by which I mean, in thinking geographically about capitalism, how does that destabilize the promises that it seems to offer to us, only to draw them away every time it thinks we're getting close? And how can we, in some sense, exceed and go beyond this? And how does geographical thinking, in some sense, force us to go beyond? So this is kind of common sense capitalism, right? This is the definition we would all trot out or we would force our students to trot out. It's about commodities, markets, a free labor market, with labor as now a commodity, innovation, entrepreneurship, growth, accumulation, pluralist democracy is usually attached to that almost without thinking. And it's about the notion of this being superior to past and present alternatives, a notion of a path of developmentalism with capitalism as the as the highest form of life, if you will. Where does this come from? Well, this is a monism. This is something which, 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 which is pervasively believed uh, in all, out of all kinds of social positionalities they, these days, but it emerges out of a very particular geographical and, and, and social perspective. The liberal enlightenment philosophers, particularly of Scotland and, uh, and England, but also to some degree of France, trying to articulate a vision for a secular society, a post-religious society, and building this on private property in the case of Locke, free, uh, uh, so the, the invisible hand in the case of Adam Smith, free trade doctrine in the case of Ricardo, with the disruptive voice of Karl Marx, the German immigrant to this British political economy, digging away underneath to say it's not as simple as all that. But the capitalism that they describe is a capitalism that they are finding and observing in Europe at the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century. And as other scholars have shown us, that's really a coalescence that's come out of a much more rich history, more geographically variated and long history of capitalism. We can go back to the beginning of the 15th century to before Columbus sailed the ocean blue, and, and scholars doing this kind of, of, of archaeological and, 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 and um, economic sociological work have identified that capitalism as a, as a set of practices existed throughout the old world. It wasn't simply, it wasn't in fact at all really very much a European phenomenon exactly. Um, there were trading societies across the Indian Ocean. Just read Amitav Ghosh's novels if you're not familiar with that down the east coast of Africa, throughout the Central Asia and the Middle East, out into the Southeast Asia and, 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 and into China. Now, there are a whole variety of ways in which people practice capitalism, if we think of capitalism as about producing and trading commodities, in those various contexts. But that multiplicity of local capitalist practices coalesced into a European monism as a result of colonial processes through which Europe 
rose to become the center of the world. The geographer Jim Blout has written about this in, in I think, very compelling ways, and other scholars outside geography have, have come to the same conclusion, really arguing that what, the reason capitalism emerged in Europe is not because there was something special about being Europe, European, something about religion, if you're, if you're, if you're Max Weber, something about the geography or, or the polity or, or the climate of Europe. Rather, what Blout and others argue is that Europe was lucky because it happened to be close to the New World, and it was easy for Europe to take advantage of that um, a possibility to accumulate wealth, capital, develop industrial practices, and so on. And through this process, in industrialization, which don't, was, was predominantly a, a um, non-European phenomenon prior to 1750, as the left-hand bar in this slide from, from Peroch shows, um, becomes a European phenomenon. The uh, India and East Asia are literally de-industrialized. Um, economists like Jeffrey Williamson have, have traced this process. And we see the emergence of what um, Karl Pomeranz has called the Great Divergence as a prosperous China and India relative to a marginal and struggling Europe um, are left behind as Europe itself um, succeeds through these processes, then coming to believe it's all due to us as Europeans, not due to our unequal relations with the colonized world that brings this about. And so an idea of capitalism is invented as if it were simply what is to be found in Europe at the time of the end of the Enlightenment, um, a sense of one form of capitalism becoming natural and universal as other trajectories are set aside. We can take the case of the free trade doctrine, which is very broadly a, a common sense these days, if you will, to use a term that Doreen Massey was using. How do we come to believe in this? Well, again, it was not a theoretical truth about the world that was established through logical means. It was a social process through which a group of Manchester capitalists led by Richard Cobden here engaged in a spatial process of of, 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 of intellectual and political activism, taking key spaces and bringing them together to drag Robert Peel in the bottom left-hand image here to um, passing the um, Corn Law re repeal, repeal of, 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 of tariffs on, on, on the trade of wheat against the interests of his own party. And, and, and then this idea becomes ex post rationalized by David Ricardo, an international econ economist ever since, all the way down to Paul Krugman, as if it were just a natural process. But it's a particular local belief that scaled up from Manchester to England, and as soon as it was adopted, uh, Manchester to London, as soon as it was adopted in London, it became a global practice because of Britain's influence over the rest of the world. Although famously in the United States, uh, we, we, we resisted that uh, from Alexander Hamilton up until really uh, the Bretton Woods Agreement by, by pursuing policies that would allow us to build industries behind barriers, things that we now tell other countries they shouldn't be doing. We can look at some of globalizing capitalism's most trenchant critics, many of them emerging out of third world positionalities like Dos Santos, Roy Marini, um, Samir Amin, and, uh, and, and so on. But even those critiques often accept the European norm of what capitalism is as the norm against which to judge how the rest of the world has been screwed by unequal trade relations, a position that Arturo Escobar, among others, criticized as kind of accepting a common sense view of development as the only way it can possibly happen. But why do we care? Well, we care because globalizing capitalism is throwing up problems for us on an everyday basis at every geographical scale like never before. Problems which become more and more stark. And problems to which increasingly we turn to the idea of free markets as if it's a magical solution. Like free markets being a particular form of capitalism, the current common sense of capitalism, if you will. So we can counterpose people like Bill Ackman perishing capital hedge fund manager makes $700 million, I'm sorry, a net worth of $700 million, who buys a penthouse in this apartment building in downtown New York, 
that costs him just a little over $90 million. And he's the 1,175th richest person in the world, according to Forbes, recently famous for his attacks on Herbalife and his attempts to enroll um, the US state to support his, his, his financial shenanigans. We can counterpose him as one New York resident with another New York resident, Shanita Simon, a shift supervisor at Kentucky Fried Chicken, making $7.75 an hour, um, zero wealth, and it would take six months of work for her to afford one square foot of Bill Ackman's apartment. In short, we are living in a new gilded age, right in the heart of capitalism in the United States, in New York City, where these disparities just seem to get greater and greater. How does thinking geographically help us understand these processes and help us get out of, of, of this, the common sense that we find ourselves in? That's what I've called geographical conditions of impossibility. And what I want to counterpose here, this is a turn to, to something I'm a little bit uncomfortable about because it's a turn to, to disciplinary sort of generalizations, but to counterpose one way of thinking about the geography of, geog of globalizing capitalism, which emerges much more out of the field of economics, what Jacques Tisse has, has dubbed geographical economics, based in this particular set of principles of how we make sense of the world, uh, listed here, against the approach which has come to dominate um, ge geographical discussion about this, which I'm going to label here economic geography, which has a very different set of things that matter as a result of the, of the way in which thinking geographically gives you a different lens to thinking economically. And out of this tradition of, of, of thought on, on the bottom side here, I want to talk about how ge thinking geographically destabilizes, if you like, Pollyannic accounts of globalizing capitalism through a set of examples, what I've called six propositions. And we're going to work gradually from the purely economic out to much beyond that. Proposition one, capitalism's spatiality disrupts the ideal of competitive equilibrium. We've known this in geography going back to location theory in the 1960s, but it's often lost. It can be captured under Starrett's so-called spatial impossibility theorem. If space is homogeneous, which it isn't, Transport is costly. Preferences are locally non-satiated. In other words, adopting all of the starting assumptions of thinking economically about the, about the geography. Even then, there is no competitive equilibrium that emerges. The, the competitive solutions that are at the heart of, 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 of the economic way of thinking about capitalism are impossible in a spatially extensive economy. Proposition two, the production and spatio-temporal circulation of commodities is disequilibrating, less than rational, and productive of social, socio-spatial inequality and conflict. Unlike against, again, thinking economically about this process, which tends to stress um, equilibrium, rational choice, rational outcomes, and, and inequality is something that capitalism will overcome. What does it mean commodity production takes time and space? Well, you start with a place of production. Uh, there's a certain time period that it has to happen. Capital gets advanced. Inputs are purchased. Production happens. Wages are paid to labor. Output happens. Circulation happens. Sales happen. And finally, you hope to get your profits back. So, it's a cap so production takes time. It's not an instantaneous process. And it occurs across space because those inputs have to come from somewhere. The product you make has to be shipped somewhere, not just to consumers, but to other firms in, in a highly relational economy. And in the process, accessibility itself has to be produced as a commodity. And when we pay attention to the necessity of producing space, producing the possibility of connecting these things together, and the economic sectors involved in that, transportation, communications, and so on, that profoundly disrupts the, 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 the economic logic of capitalism is passed down out of economic thinking. So we can construct a model which, which represents this kind of approach. This is work that, that I've done with Paul Plummer and, and Luke Bergman, 
And you can show that sometimes that converges to equilibrium, but often it's, 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 it's a cyclic and it, it can be even quite chaotic. So even here within the sort of laws of, of the political economy, if you will, introducing space profoundly disrupts these processes. This means that the economic way of thinking about this, which is that it intended actions have intended consequences, that's the very definition of a rational choice, right? It's a, you get what you want is destabilized when we take the spatiality and the production of accessibility seriously. Becomes unintended consequences become increasingly likely, which means that spatiality is constitutive of disequilibrium. Some of that comes through processes of how technical change disrupts things, how labor relations disrupt things, how geographies of specialization disrupt things. But it's also political because of the conflicts of economic interest between the various actors in the economy things which we can call a politics of production, whether it's playing out uh, in the workplace in terms of conditions of work being negotiated with, with the owner, or whether it's playing out nationally in terms of redistributive taxes and so on and so forth. Proposition three, geographies of politics and governance co-evolve with those of globalizing capitalism. Here, the insight is that capitalism is not self-regulating. State intervention is necessary uh, forms of governance emerge which shift over time, which shift over space. Political struggle happens. Um, governable subjects are produced by political processes operate. All of the things we've talked about in contemporary geographical political economy, policy dynamics, governments at a distance, and so on. That is a whole set of processes which are integral to capitalism because without them, the markets don't function, and with them, the markets get continue to get destabilized. Proposition four, here we're moving beyond the economy. Biophysical and social cultural processes ex exceed globalizing capitalism, notwithstanding attempts to fit them in, to align them to lo that logic. Let's start with a more than human economy. Um, there are um, a, a variety of ways in which um, we try and commodify the biophysical world. We, 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 we privatize things, we attempt, we attempt to control these objects, we, 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 we create markets in which we can buy and sell them, and, and in that way incorporate nature into the economy. But nature is also always continually escaping the economy. There are unintended consequences we have on the natural world. Um, the, the, the flows of carbon that we understand far, far, far too little about, and the attempts to bring these back into the economy in terms of such things as carbon trading or environmental services, none of which ever suffice to stop nature from escaping in some sense that economic grasp. The same applies in the socio-cultural realm. Uh, on the one hand, we're trying to commodify culture. We talk about the cultural industries. We talk about um, commodifying bodies by turning them in, into labor and, 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 and knowledge to be traded. We talk about cons consumers and, 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 and people contributing to the economy that way. We talk about entrepreneur, fostering entrepreneurial behavior, fostering responsible behavior, libertarian paternalism, um, and commodifying cultural artifacts. All of that is going on all the time, but even as that's going on, once again, these things are being exceeded by processes of identity construction, by, by, by phenomena such as care for one another, mutuality, love, and, and so on, each of which, um, again, escapes the logic of capitalism. So thinking geographically here means taking the, what's in going on in the economy and, and connecting it with what's happening in the biophysical world, with what's happening socially and culturally, in ways which each, again, is constitutive of the other. Proposition five. Mainstream, place-based imaginaries, by mainstream I mean sort of economic thinking, are developmentalist. And even geographical development, however, makes this vision unworkable. I don't have time to go into this in any detail right now, but we can identify a series of very influential books that have emerged, written by economists about, the, about development. The six on the right-hand side there are about international development, the two on the left are about regional development, all of which stress that development is, has to do with conditions in a place. If you've got the right conditions, you succeed. If you've got the wrong conditions, you fail. 
So how do we engineer the right conditions? Well, how do we make the right, the governance system more like the United States, and so on and, and, and so, on, so forth. There's been incredible richness of economic research here empirically, extending back over two centuries, really unpacking the economy, but never getting out of this kind of methodological territorialism, this view that success or failure is rooted in what we have right here inside our boundaries. When we think of the geographical world as a set of independent territorial objects, it's our natural inclination to put those on a graph and to correlate them with something, and all of a sudden that looks like a developmental sequence, right? That you're moving from one exchange to the other by changing the independent variable. And this is, of course, Walt Rostow's idea of stages of economic development through which all countries are supposed to pass. Stages which Simon Kuznets then articulates in terms of rising but eventually falling income inequality. Others have re reparsed that to talk about rising and then falling environmental costs. It's something that Doreen Massey calls rearranging spatial differences into a temporal sequence. And that happens as a result of separating the economy into these series of, of autonomous territorial units, just like we separate the actors into a series of autonomous individuals. In fact, however, we have persistent uneven geographical development. It's arguably increasingly so since the onset of, of, of neoliberal common sense. We have a world that's connected together highly unevenly also in terms of trade flows, in terms of capital flows, in terms of foreign direct investment. And the accessibilities that are being produced to make that world work are also highly uneven. The geographies of transportation connecting some places and leaving others off the map. The geographies of, 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 of communication, of, of, of cables, uh, uh, and, and, and internet backbones, and so on. The world is getting smaller, but that doesn't mean the world is getting flatter. And if you don't believe me, read Michael Lewis's book, Flash Boys, about high frequency trading. He tells a story about this group, Spread Networks, who spend $300 million to drill a, a fiber optic line as straight as possible from New York to Chicago through the, the Allegheny Mountains of Pennsylvania. Cost them $300 million in order to save traders in Chicago four milliseconds on their trade, right? So here, space matters profoundly, even in a world where time is moving very rapidly. Or the way in which those same traders in the sort of online spaces that now simulate or, or stand in for the New York Stock Exchange jostle with one another to make sure they get their server closer to the New York Stock Exchange server than anybody else, again, to save that millisecond, right? Proposition six, alternatives to capitalism, to globalizing capitalism, are, every, are both ever-present and necessary. If we don't have this nice, neat developmental trajectory, then those alternatives become compelling. We can separate them into some which are more about resistance, others which are more about contestation. But what we're really doing here is making space for alternatives that take us beyond globalizing capitalism. Globalizing capitalism, if you will, is an emergent Euro-American norm about how to run the economy, one that empowers some but fails the multitude. It's a norm which emerges in Europe in the, 19th, in the 18th century and 19th century and, and then, then stabilizes there as if that's the modest way of understanding the world. And the challenge is to provincialize that norm, to, to disrupt it, if you will, to make space for alternatives. It doesn't follow, however, that if we get rid of capitalism, then we simply replace it with socialism. It's not like there's one best practice universally to replace by another best practice universally. As geographers, we know these things, um, best practices don't work like that. Things have to be done differently in different places. Again, we're back here to a sense of engaged pluralism, of, of, of shifting spatio-temporal assemblages of, of social experiments, different ways of trying to make life better in all kinds of different contexts, which are not only to be in some sense, paid attention to in their own right rather than saying that's stupid because that doesn't fit into globalizing capitalism, but also to be engaged with one another, to learn from one another, not that one of those emerges as the magic answer, but they learn from mutual criticism. A criticism which has always and should have ethical normative commitments, commitments where I would emphasize emancipation, justice, not just to humans, but to the more than human world in general.
To conclude, thinking geographically is about possible worlds. That, that fourth theme emerges here. There is an unrealized potential of this kind of geographical thinking, both in terms of achieving it within, amongst those people who, who, who think of themselves as doing things geographical, as well as in terms of, of its impact on helping shape the world. It has a disruptive potential. It leads us to look at the world in, in profoundly unexpected ways, ways which, which call into question the norms which you come to believe in. And that's not just true for globalizing capitalism. And in terms of globalizing capitalism, thinking geographically does emphasize the necessary of going beyond it while leaving open as a huge set of questions where to. Thank you very much. Doreen, would you like to come up here? My other pleasure as a, as, a, as a result of doing this thing is not only that I, I get to avoid your questions, but please send them to me in other forms and grab me afterwards, is to give out the Presidential Achievement Award. This is Doreen Massey of the Open University. Some of you were in the session with her before. Many of you may not have met her. Is this your first AAG meeting? Uh, no, it's the first for a long time. It's, it is the first for a long time. First because I, re I remember it for <laughs> you, yeah. One of the things that has been the center of my term as, as president was, is to really um, advance the idea of the association as an international association, the most visible form of that you'll have come across recently is the idea of changing our name from the Association of American Geographers to the American Association of Geographers, or perhaps we could find something better, but that's at least a step in that direction. And again, I see this as trying to create spaces for new perspectives, new ways of making sense of the world, which come in and challenge the common senses that we're used to in our Anglophone US-centric perspective. So to think about this great gathering place is not a place where everybody comes to learn the US way of doing geography, but we should be learning from those perspectives. Doreen Massey, to me, is, is a great person to, to honor in this situation. While the UK is admittedly one of the kind of twin towers of Anglophone geography with a global influence, nevertheless, she is arguably the most important and influential non-US geographer not to have attended our meetings in some time. <laughs> if, you want, if you were listening carefully to my paper and you're familiar with her work, you'll have seen it inflected throughout the things that I was talking about. She's been, had more influence on my thinking about geography, than, I think, than anybody else. And this is also a chance for, some, for people who would never have a chance to, to, to meet her, particularly students and, and non-academics here, to have a chance to do so. Doreen is known for profound contributions to our understanding of regional inequality, differentiation, and restructuring through such things as the idea of spatial divisions of labor and the sedimentary layering of economic processes over time, bringing her physical geographic background in, in, into this. Remarkably sophisticated theorizations of space, society, and geography around the idea which is now common parlance, at least among human geographers, of relational space. The profound importance of paying attention to gender and other positionalities, gender, class, and, 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 and so on, but gender in particular. Terms like global sense of place, power geometries, world city, all terms that come from her work, and the idea of the multiplicity of trajectories that I've already talked about. And, of, and also, she's somebody who's written very thoughtfully about bringing human and physical geography together in non-reductive ways, very much along the lines of what I think of as thinking geographically. So it's my honor and privilege to award you this Presidential Achievement Award. You get a certificate, <laughs> and you get what we like to call the hockey puck. The what? The hockey puck. You have to explain that. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> You'll see what I mean. So this means an ice hockey puck. This is not field hockey. This is ice hockey. You know, the thing that they 
<laughs> push Some around the ice. Explain. Yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks ever so much. It's uh, it's a real honour to get this. It was a complete surprise when Eric wrote to me. In fact, his email started, Doreen, I want to invite you to the AAG. Before you say no, <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you why. And I'm really glad to be here. I've, it's not just an honour, but it's been a real pleasure the last few days being here. I've enjoyed every minute of it. So thank you for all the conversations that I've had and the engagements. Thanks very much indeed. And it's a privilege to have had you here. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you. <laughs> Put that down.